Thank you very much. That was beautiful. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, we're grateful to have neighbors like Bruce and Alinda Cush. In fact, today I'm going to talk a little bit about our neighbors. And you'll notice that as I do that, the Savior asked, was asked, but who is my neighbor? And our answer, it's Bruce and Alinda Cush. <laughs> That's who our neighbor is. Uh, they live right across the street from us, and we're, we're delighted to be here with them and with all of you. We're, we're so proud of you for all of that you're accomplishing here, for the decision that you've made to continue to get a good education. I just want you to know how much we love you. Um, I, uh, I'm always instructed to bring the love of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve, and I share that with you this morning. I was just in the meeting of the Quorum of the Twelve this morning. And we express our love to you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your devotion to the gospel of Jesus Christ. My hope is that we can talk about an important topic that will uh, maybe bring enlightenment to all of us about uh, how we respond as disciples. As I begin, I would share with you that uh, we have become, in the world today, spectators. Um, the World Cup just concluded um, recently, and I noticed online that over a billion people watched the World Cup. Can you believe that? A billion people watched that. Just two days ago, we had a big event in the United States that they called the Super Bowl, and there were 113 million people who watched that. Uh, we've become a, a generation of spectators people who watch, people who are always looking to see what others are, are doing. And I'd like to talk to you about our discipleship. I begin by sharing with you what I consider to be the landmark talk um, to the young adults of the Church just this past year when President Nelson spoke to you about Choices for Eternity. My wife and I listened to that talk, and as soon as President Nelson completed his address, my wife turned to me and said, that was Samuel the Lamanite up on the wall. And I agreed with her. President Nelson taught us what we needed to know, and he talked to us about our identity. And he said that our identity is that we are a child of God, that we are a child of the covenant, and finally, that we are a disciple of Jesus Christ. I love that because it helped me understand my identity and what I needed to be focused on. Today, I'd like to focus on number three, our role as disciples of Jesus Christ, and maybe begin by talking with you about what a disciple is. The Bible Dictionary teaches us that a disciple is a pupil or a learner. You all know all about that. That's who you are right now as you attend Ensign College. It's a name used to denote all followers of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. We're followers of Jesus Christ. We're His disciples. As we follow Him, we call that discipleship. And so today I'd like to talk with you just a minute about our individual discipleship. I would first ask you, if you and I are disciples of Jesus Christ, what does discipleship look like? If I were trying to figure out how I can be a disciple or what that might look like in my life, where would I turn to figure that out? And of course, the most important source is, is the Savior Himself. He was asked, how can I, by a lawyer, in fact, it says a lawyer came tempting him. I, uh, I share that with you because I was a lawyer for 29 years, and, and I often am grateful for these lawyers who came tempting him because some of the good things in the New Testament came because lawyers did that. Uh, they weren't always the best folks around, but a lot of the good information we have from the Savior came because a lawyer came tempting him asking him, Master, how, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And the Savior shared with him the two great commandments. 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then he said, And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And we've been taught recently that we don't reverse those two commandments, that the first one is to love God, and the second one is to love our neighbor. Here's the interesting thing that happened. Right after the Savior said that, this lawyer said to him, but who is my neighbor? And the Savior gave the most amazing answer. He started to tell him in Luke chapter 10 that a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And if any of you are familiar with the geography, you'll know that Jericho is below sea level. Jerusalem is high, high above sea level. And he says that a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, symbolic of you and me as we've come down from heaven. To, the, to this earth. And then the Savior said that he fell among thieves. And I want to just share with you quickly the Bible video for just a minute that depicts this amazing event that the Savior described. Because the Savior mentioned in this parable of the Good Samaritan that a priest, a priest in the church, walked by this man, a Levite, walked by this man who had fell among thieves, and then a Samaritan helped him. Let's just watch this great depiction. After the Savior concludes that parable, he turns to the lawyer and said, who was his neighbor? And the answer, of course, was the Good Samaritan who helped him. Um, it's interesting that in our day, Timothy said, 
This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And from the Doctrine and Covenants, and in that day shall be heard of wars and rumors of wars, and the whole earth shall be in commotion, and men's hearts shall fail them. So I wonder what that looks like for us as current Latter-day Disciples of Jesus Christ. And as I look around the world today, can I share with you what I see sometimes? This is one of the things I see. Um, this wasn't necessarily a temptation for my generation because when I was a young man growing up, we only had one channel on the television, and it was in black and white. And so we didn't have a lot of screen time like you do. This is an interesting thing for you and I to ponder today as all of us are involved in, in using technology. And I have to say that this is one of my favorite things. I love my phone. I love what it can tell me and what it can teach me. But we need to be think carefully about what it means for our discipleship. During COVID, my wife and I figured out what binge watching was. And uh, maybe you did too. Um, I love this little cartoon that says, are you still watching? And he says, I'll always be watching. Um, we have a tendency to spend our time uh, doing things that don't require us to do any action at all. This is the, perhaps the most interesting one that I wanted to share with you because it has a lot to do with the parable of the Good Samaritan. I read that there have been sociologic, sociological studies of our generation where they've learned that they've learned something that they call the bystander effect, which is that Rather than engaging with people around us, we have a tendency to just be engaged on our phones. And it goes to an even more difficult level when people use a smartphone to film rather than to help. In fact, I think you would all agree with me that in our day, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the priest, if he had had a smartphone with him, would probably have filmed this man laying in the road, and he would have shared it on social media. Do you know what I saw on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho? Look what I saw. And the Levite priest might have shared that. Using our smartphone to film rather than to help. You see, discipleship is not a spectator sport. It requires you and it requires me to act. And so I share with you this interesting scripture out of the Book of Mormon. This is the Book of Mormon inside the Book of Mormon, okay? And it begins in chapter 1, verse 1, with this. And now I, Mormon, make a record of the things which I have both seen and heard and call it the Book of Mormon. And about the time that Amaron hid up the records unto the Lord, he came unto me, I being about 10 years of age. Now, I want to just stop right there because I'd like you to think with me about what's happening here. This isn't a really unique experience. Amaron has a record. What record does he have? He has the brass plates of Laban. He has First and Second Nephi, Jerem, Omni, Words of Mormon, Mosiah, Alma, Helaman, Third and Fourth Nephi, Mormon, Ether, Moroni. He's got all those records, and he's about to give it to a ten-year-old. Am I the only one that's concerned about that? <laughs> I have a ten-year-old grandson, and I think he's pretty cool. I'm not sure I'd give him the plates of Laban. But Amaron trusts Mormon, and he goes on to tell us why he trusts him. He says, And I began to be learned somewhat after the manner of the learning of my people. And Amron said unto me, I perceive that thou art a sober child and art quick to observe. 
I would say to all of you today that disciples of Jesus Christ are quick to observe. Instead of looking down, we're always looking up. We're looking to see who it is we can help. We're looking to see what we can do to, to share the gospel. We're looking to, do, to see what we can do when others are in need. There's probably no better example that I know personally than my wife Marcia at this. Um, I'll never forget an experience in one of our sacrament meetings when one of our sons was passing the sacrament and Marcia was sitting in the middle of the row. And it was fast Sunday and our son was passing the sacrament and she could see that he started to look like he was wavering a bit. He hadn't eaten that day and she could see that he was getting unsteady on his feet and he started to fall and she jumped clear through the middle of the aisle and caught him before he fell. And it was a miraculous thing. We all call her Supermom because of that. But she was quick to observe. When she and I go to state conferences or on mission tours, Marcia is always looking. And she'll say to me, I think we need to visit with that missionary. It looks like he or she is struggling. A disciple of Jesus Christ is always quick to observe wherever we go. I share this interesting scripture. Um, this one is fascinating to me because for many years I read this, but I didn't realize that Lehi, as he teaches his sons, sons and daughters about agency, talks about two different types of creations. Let's see if we can identify those. It says, And now, my sons, I speak unto you these things for your profit and learning. For there is a God, and he hath created all things, both the heavens and the earth, and all things in, that in them are, both things to act and things to be acted upon. Let me see if I can tell you how I understand that scripture. Um, this podium here is made of wood. It used to be a tree out in the forest. When the lumberjacks went to cut this tree down, did the tree raise its limb and say, choose me, I want to be in the assembly hall on Temple Square? Did the tree choose to be here? It didn't. Was the tree created to act or to be acted upon? Clearly acted upon. When you went to eat your banana for breakfast this morning, did anybody's, breakfast say, don't eat, did anybody's banana say, don't eat me today? Mine didn't. When God created the banana, did he create it to act or to be acted upon? Clearly acted upon. All of God's creations, no matter where we look, were created to be acted upon except you. He created you to act. And it's critical for us to understand that as disciples of Jesus Christ, it's why we came to this earth, that you and I would come and exercise our agency and act when we see things that need to be acted upon. You're all familiar with this great scripture from the Doctrine and Covenants. It says, Verily I say, men should be anxiously engaged in a good cause, and do many things of their own free will, and bring to pass much righteousness. When Marcy and I were raising our children in Twin Falls, Idaho, she attended uh, a BYU Education Week. And one of the speakers that talked at that Education Week was Sister Mary Hales, the wife of Elder Robert D. Hales. Sister Hales actually just passed away a few weeks ago. She was an incredible teacher. And at this BYU Education Week, she taught something that really helped us in our family. And this, in, in, a, in a few simple words, is what she taught. We go to church to give, not to get. We go to church to give, not to get. And she talked about her experience as she would walk in to the, at the chapel door before sacrament meeting, and when she arrived at the chapel door, she would look to see who in the congregation was sitting by themselves. She would look to see who needed help during sacrament meeting because they had a number of children. She would look to see, is there someone new here that I haven't seen before? Because she knew that she was going to church to give, not to get. As she went to her Relief Society, her Sunday school lesson, if it wasn't quite as good as she had hoped it would be, 
she would raise her hand and try to help the teacher. After the lesson, she would go up and compliment the teacher and thank them for their preparation, thank them for their effort, because she went to give, not to get. So you can imagine in our family when anyone said, Mom or Dad, I don't get anything out of Sunday school. You know what we said to them? <laughs> That's because we don't go to get. Did you think we went to get? We actually go to give. Discipleship is not a spectator sport. We go to church to give. And I can tell you, as the young, wonderful people of this church, our rising generation, that when you go to church to give, as you know, the heavens open. The Lord blesses us in ways that we can't imagine. He helps us become who we need to become. And we become his true disciples. James said it this way, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only. And this last phrase is perhaps the one that I miss the most in my life. He says, deceiving your own selves. So let me tell you what that looks like to me. Many times in my life I've woken up on a Sunday morning, I, I went to my leadership meeting, I went to sacrament meeting, I went to Sunday school, I went to my priesthood meeting, check, 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 check. I got it done. I spiked the ball in the end zone. I did it. And guess what? I was deceiving myself because I'd just gone to a lot of meetings. And James teaches us that we need to be doers of the word, not hearers only. And that when we think that, that we deceive ourselves. To me, this is one of the most powerful teachings of the Savior. He said, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. The Savior was teaching us that if we will do the will of the Father, we'll know of the doctrine. And so sometimes I'll hear someone say, you know what, I don't, I don't really like missionary work to do that. And they usually haven't ever done it. If you want to learn about missionary work, you actually have to do it. If you want to learn about the temple, you have to go to the temple. If you want to learn about serving other people, you actually need to serve other people. If any man will do the will of the Father, he will know of the doctrine. They'll understand it. They'll know. We have to be doing. I want you to know that there has never been a better time to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ than today. And to just give you a few brief examples, I would share with you that when I was a senior in high school and I went to my seminary class, they had a picture of all 12 temples of the Church in front of my classroom. All 12. I had to memorize all 12 for my test. I had to know where they all were. Imagine doing that today with the 300 that are existing or have been announced with many, many more to come. They gave me my group sheet. You all don't even know what that is, but it was this long piece of paper where I put my four generations, and they, they would tell me, we're going we're gonna, to uh, do the work for everyone who ever lived. And I was a cynical teenager, and I was like, I don't think so. We only have 12 temples. Look at my group sheet. But you and I have seen the future. We have seen the announcements by President Nelson of the, all the temples across the earth, like I said, with many more to come. And you and I can go to the dentist's office, and while we wait for the dentist, I can get a name to take to the temple on my smartphone. This is incredible. The Lord teaches us in Moses 1.39, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And I like to add, and he will not fail. He's going to do it. And you and I are beginning to see how that can happen. We live in an amazing time. When I was a young man, I remember coming to Temple Square. Um, we had 15,000 missionaries. And they were telling us, this is the most missionaries we've ever had, 15,000. 
There were three million members, and we all just thought, wow, this is as good as it gets. And now, when we're almost 17 million with 60, 60, almost 65,000 missionaries now, it's amazing to see. There's never been a better time to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ than today. Our ability to help people all around the world, as President Oaks reported to us in our last general conference, is amazing to see. And so I hope that you can see as disciples of Jesus Christ that this is an amazing time to live and that you'll have a great desire to want to participate as active participants as we continue to move this work forward across the world. Nephi said this, and all of you have this scripture memorized. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, said unto my father, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. For I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them, that they may accomplish the thing which he commanded them. Those words, go and do, are critical for us. I like how Nephi said it. Disciples of Jesus Christ, that's who we are. That's our identity. Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ and endure to the end, Behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Do you remember the question the lawyer asked the Savior? Master, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Nephi taught us, right? We press forward with a steadfastness in Christ. I say to you, this amazing rising generation of the church, that you're going to see things that I could never imagine happen, not only in this world, but with the church of Jesus Christ. I would say, as Joseph Smith says in the 128th section, shall we not go on in so great a cause? Go forward, not backward. Let your hearts rejoice and be exceedingly glad. So I end how I began, that as disciples of Jesus Christ, it isn't a spectator sport. Although this is an amazing tool, although it's something we can use, although there's a lot of other activities we can be involved in, you and I need to be really good at this. When we see people in need, we need to respond. When we see people who are struggling, we need to help. That's what disciples do. I hope that as we think about the teachings of the Savior, I hope that as President Nelson has helped you and helped me understand our identity, that as disciples of Jesus Christ, that we will move forward with faith in Him, knowing that with Him we can accomplish anything. Again, I share our love with you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the wonderful work that you're accomplishing here at Ensign College. We love you. I bear my witness to you that God lives, that he truly is our Father, that we are his and he is ours, that the Savior Jesus Christ is our Savior and our Redeemer. I love him. I am grateful for his teachings. I bear my witness to you that we have living prophets and apostles on the earth today whom I sustain with all my heart. And I share that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.